Hi, my name is James. In this module, we're going to be taking a look at how to get started using ASP.NET Core in Visual Studio 2017. My name is James Churchill, as I just mentioned. I'm a teacher at Treehouse. We do online education for brand new beginner students, as well as developers who are experienced working on the job who want to keep their skills updated. I've got about 16 years of professional development experience, mostly working as a consultant doing web development. I've also been a regional speaker and trainer. I have presented and given talks in Oregon, Washington, Utah, Tennessee, Idaho, lots of great places. Real quickly, our basic agenda, we're going to start just by kind of leveling the playing field by talking about or giving a quick introduction to .NET Core and ASP.NET Core. Then we're going to do jump into some demos. We're going to create a project using Visual Studio 2017. We're going to take a look at the new CS Proj project system. And then we're going to take a quick look at kind of the underpinnings of an ASP.NET Core application, program.cs, startup.cs, before we move on to looking at the middleware pipeline, a little bit of .NET Core CLI, just to show you what that experience is like outside of Visual Studio. Then we'll, look, we'll create an MVC project, and time permitting, we'll look at a quick demo of tag helpers and API controllers. So to start, let's just give a quick overview of what .NET Core is. So .NET Core is an open source, cross-platform version of .NET. It's supported on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. It's a subset of the full .NET framework. So application models like WinForms, WPF, and ASP.NET WinForms, or WebForms, are not part of .NET Core. Now .NET Core and ASP.NET Core are delivered as a set of granular, well-factored NuGet packages. This gives you a pay-for-what-you-use model. And you only have to include what is needed for your app to actually run. So you can deploy .NET Core with your app, or it can be installed side-by-side -side in the user account or machine-wide. If deployed with your app, you only deploy what your application needs. This keeps things running fast and lean. .NET Core only supports a single app model, console apps. So that might seem a little limiting, but as we'll see when we create our ASP.NET Core project, other app models can be built on top of that. ASP.NET Core is a significant redesign of ASP.NET. It's a complete rewrite of the ASP.NET web framework. This is the biggest release of ASP.NET since version 1.0. To give you an idea, it's no longer based on system web DLL. Having a clean break from the past gave the ASP.NET team the ability to develop a fast, modern, cross-platform web framework to meet their stated design goals. It runs on .NET Core or the full .NET framework. This gives you the choice and flexibility to use the framework that best supports your situation. In this session, we're going to be primarily using the .NET Core tooling that's available in Visual Studio 2017. The .NET Core tooling also includes the .NET Core command line interface, or CLI. That gives you the ability to develop applications outside of Visual Studio, which is important if you're doing cross-platform development. When you install Visual Studio 2017, you'll see that there's a brand new installation experience. Part of this is selecting what workloads you want to include as part of your Visual Studio installation. In order to get the .NET Core tooling installed and ability to, to develop ASP.NET Core applications, you're going to want to select the ASP.NET and Web Development workload. This will give you tools to develop ASP.NET and ASP.NET Core applications. So that's enough introduction. Let's go ahead and jump right into some demos. And the very first one that we're going to do is we're going to use Visual Studio 2017 to create our first project. From the new project dialog, we have two options available to us. We have a web application template here for .NET Core and one for the full .NET framework. Typically, you're going to want to target .NET Core. 
This gives you the ability to develop or deploy your application onto non-Windows platforms, and you can also take advantage of the Docker tools in Visual Studio. But if you need a feature that's not yet part of .NET Core or available there, then you might need to target the full .NET framework. But for this example, we're going to go ahead, we're going to go ahead and target .NET Core. For my application name, I'm going to name this something creative, like first ASP.NET Core app. I spent a lot of time thinking about what to name my projects, and you can probably tell. And then I'm going to click OK. Now, this will take you to the second part of the project setup. You're familiar with this if you've created ASP.NET projects before. This allows us to pick the specific ASP.NET Core template that we want to use to create our project. We have empty, web API, or web application. For our first project, I'm going to go ahead and select the empty. Down here, you'll notice that there's a checkbox to enable Docker support. We're not going to cover Docker in this module, but that's what you would check in order to do that. Over here on the right, just like you've seen before, you can change your authentication options. We currently have no authentication selected. We'll keep that that way just to keep things simple. And then I'll click OK to create our project. As soon as our project is loaded here in the Solution Explorer, the first thing that I want to call attention to is this new Dependencies folder. This used to be called References. Inside of here, if we expand this, we can see a NuGet folder, which contains our NuGet packages that we're referencing, and an SDK folder. The Microsoft.NET Core.app is the .NET Core framework that we just targeted. Now, if you look at our other files here in the project, we'll see program.cs and startup.cs, but you'll notice that there's something missing here if you've done ASP.NET Core development before. There's no project.json file. And why is that? Well, the new project system inside of Visual Studio 2017 that's part of the .NET Core tooling is based on MS Build. So, to be clear, this is not the CS Proj that you know and, well, probably generally dislike. There's been, there have been many improvements made to MS Build in order to, to accomplish what they wanted to accomplish with ASP.NET Core applications. Not the least of which is that we can now right-click on our project and select Edit First ASP.NET Core App CS Proj. And we can do this without having to close the project or unload it. Now, probably the first thing that you'll notice when you see the, CS, the new CS Proj format is look at how few elements there are within the CS Proj. If you're anything, in my experience, um, if, if it's anything like my experience, you're used to seeing a lot of elements here. They've been able to par this down by using a lot of smart defaults, and they're also using file globbing so they don't have to include individual references to files. Every file that's in your project folder that's on the file system is now by default part of your project. What that means is that you can make changes to the file system and they're just going to be picked up inside of your project. That means, for instance, if you switch branches, if you're using Git, um, then the project will just automatically take notice of that and adjust. Or if you add, remove, or rename files and folders, those will be picked up automatically as well. This one change will go a long ways to reducing the kind of merge conflicts that .NET developers have dealt with for years. The other thing that you'll notice is that we have package references to NuGet packages right here in CSProj. It's not in a separate fi or file. And especially cool, watch this. So if I pin my Solution Explorer back open again, and I'm going to just cut this package reference while we keep an eye over here on the right. So I'm going to cut, and I'm going to save. And notice that my NuGet dependencies list is going to stay in sync with what my CSProj is that I'm editing over in the editor. So it's live editing of the file, so cool. And if I undo, and save again, then that reference is going to come back. You'll notice that there's a little bit of a caution or a yield sign that was there. That's the package being restored so that it's available to our project to use. If you've done 
ASP.NET Core development before, and let's say you have an existing project, you may have a project.json file that you're going to want to migrate as you bring it forward into Visual Studio 2017. Well, it's not a matter of that you might want to, you're going to have to. The new CS Proj MS Build project system is, is the only way that you can develop projects, ASP.NET Core projects, in Visual Studio 2017. Now, something to take note is that in Visual Studio 2015, the preview tooling only supports project.json, the project system, that project system. So when you migrate to 2017, it's a one-way trip into 2017. Though, that may not be as big of a deal as it sounds. Visual Studio 2017 installs side-by-side -side with Visual Studio 2015. So you should be, if you have projects that you want to keep over on Visual Studio 2015, um, if you're working on a team and maybe you're moving ahead, just coordinate with your developer, developers on your team and make sure that, that everyone is prepared to do what they need to do to keep up with that change to the project. Now, let's go ahead and switch gears and move on to looking at program.cs. Program.cs is a simple class. It has a single static method, static void main. Now, Astute.NET developers who are watching the live stream here will probably look at this and think, hmm, this looks like a console app. And you know what? You'd be right. As I mentioned a bit ago, .NET Core only supports a single app model, console apps. So this is the entry point into our application. Now what makes our app an ASP.NET Core app is that the main method is creating a host, building that host, and then running that host so it can listen for HTTP requests. Now we use the web host builder to create the host. It's a Fluent API, so we can just dot off of web host builder, the new instance, and call methods to configure our host. The first one that you see here is a method use Kestrel, and this tells the host to use the Kestrel web server. Kestrel is a cross-platform managed web server. This allows ASP.NET Core apps to be, to be developed and ran on platforms other than Windows, Mac OS and Linux, for instance. Also, I want to make note that there is a web listener server that's also available. So if your application needs to use a Windows-only feature like Windows authentication, then you could switch to using the web listener server. Um, just need to make sure to note that when you do that, your application will be typically running on Windows servers in order to support those Windows-only features. The next call that we're making here is use content root. And this is simply just saying to use the current directory as the root of our project. The next line is use IIS, IIS integration. This method configures the host so our web application can be integrated with IIS or when we're developing locally, IIS Express. Now, this is kind of an important note. IIS is no longer directly supported, meaning that IIS does not host our ASP.NET Core apps within its own process. IIS is used as a reverse proxy to Kestrel. This is the same general approach for hosting Node.js apps in IIS. The use startup method says to use our startup class when the application is starting up. And we'll take a look at, at that class in just a minute. Use application insights is to configure application insights for our application. We'll go ahead and leave that there even though we're not going to be doing anything with that specifically in this module. And then, like I mentioned before, the host is built and then we call run on that host so it can start listening for HTTP requests. Let's go take a look at our startup class. One of the first things you'll notice here is that startup is just a plain class. There's no interface implementations, no inheritance, but there are two specially named methods that our host will look for and call when our application is started up. The first is configure services. Configure services allows us to configure, well, services for our application. Services are components that their intent is to be, or they're, they're intended for consumption in our application, sometimes by middleware, sometimes by controllers, if we're doing MVC, filters, that sort of thing. 
Services are made available to these other classes through dependency injection, or DI. What's really great about ASP.NET Core is that it now includes a built-in inversion of control IOC container out of the box, and it supports constructor injection by default. Now, the built-in container, if it doesn't suit your needs for whatever reason, can be easily replaced with a container of your choice. Now, our container services method, our configure services method, doesn't do anything right now. In a later example, when we configure an MVC, or create an MVC project, we'll see an example of what that looks like. Let's move on to our configure method. Actually, let's go back for a second. Even though we're not configuring any of our own services, there are application services that we can inject into, into our configure method. IAppliCationBuilder is an example. We can use that in order to configure our middleware, middleware pipeline, which we'll take a look at in just a second. iHosting environment is used to give us information about our current environment, and iLoggerFactory is used to configure, configure logging providers, like we're doing right here, where we're adding a console logger. I'm going to go ahead and comment out these two lines just to reduce our configure method down to a single call, app.run. And what app.run is doing is it's configuring a terminal middleware component. A middleware component is going to handle an HTTP request. Now we're only going to do a very simple thing here. We're going to take the HTTP context that's handed to us and we're going to write asynchronously to the response the text, the hello world. Let's go ahead and run our application. And I'm going to do that by pressing Control F5. So I'm going to run without debugging. And once this builds and starts up here, it'll open up Edge. And we should see our text written to the response. Now, if we view source on this, just to be clear, it is just the text, hello world. There's no markup here whatsoever. Why is that? Well, because that's all that we're writing to the response. It's just the text, the string, hello world. Now, something's kind of cool, since we're not running without debugging, I can just update this file, come over here to the browser, refresh the page, and we'll see the new content. Without having to close the browser, stop the app, rebuild, and restart the app. Now, let's try another experiment. What if we were to comment out this middleware so that we're doing nothing in our configure method? I'm going to go ahead and set a breakpoint here right at the end of, that, of our method code block. Then I'm going to press F5 this time to debug so that we hit our breakpoint just to make sure that the configure method is actually being called. And here we are at our breakpoint. So I'll press F5 to continue. Oh, and we get an HTTP 404 error. So that's interesting. But it makes sense, right? We don't have, we're not configuring any middleware components in our configure method right now. So there was nothing written to the response. And what this tells us is that if we don't have any middleware in our pipeline, the default behavior is to return a 404 HTTP status code. Let's go ahead and bring that back. And let's try something else here. I wanted to, to show you an example of the ASP.NET Core's approach that, that we like to refer to as build up. So I'm going to throw an error. I'm going to say throw new exception. Throwing an exception is not asynchronous, so I'm going to take that keyword out. And then we'll run our application again. We hit our breakpoint. Oh, and there's our exception. So the, we hit our breakpoint first because we were configuring our middleware pipeline. And then the request was sent through the pipeline, which allowed our, our throw exception to be ran. And we get the 500 error. And if we open up the developer tools and switch over to network, I'm going to go ahead and refresh the page we'll see that we got 
of 500 status code. But there was no content. Our body, request body, is empty. So out of the box, we're not getting any exception handling. And, and even though we're on our local development machine, we're not getting any information about the exception that happened. What we can do, though, is that we can add another middleware component to our pipeline in order to, to give us what we're looking for, especially when we're running in development. So we're going to put this in an if conditional. So we're going to say if environment is development to make sure that we don't do this in production. And then we're going to say app.useDeveloperException page. And this will load in the developer exception page middleware component. Now, when we run our application, we should see something a little different. And it looks like we might be hung up here. Let's give it another second. OK, I'm going to go ahead and stop. Oh. There we go, and I'll close Edge. And we're just going to restart and see if we can get this to run again. OK, here's our exception. Press F5, and now we get probably what we were expecting the first time. We get a stack trace, and we can click this plus, and look at that, we get a nice little formatted code snippet showing where the exception happened. We can also click down here and show the raw exception details. If we had query string parameter values, we could see them here. If we had cookies, we could see them here. And here we can see the headers. So that's pretty cool, a nice developer exception page. But to get that, we had to add the middleware component. So this is showing, again, that ASP.NET Core uses what we call a build-up approach, as opposed to a tear-down approach. So instead of having a bunch of things turned on by default that you may or may not be using, ASP.NET Core starts out really with nothing there. And then you have to add in the middleware components to support the features that your application needs to have. Let's do one more example before we move on. Let's say that we want to serve a static page. Now something we haven't talked about yet is that ASP.NET Core applications includes a folder named www.root www.root is where all of our static content is served from. So JavaScript files, images, CSS files. If we were to not put them in www.root, they wouldn't be able to get served to requests. So we want to make sure we put those static files here in www.root. That's the default location, which can be changed through configuration. But we'll go ahead and leave the default. And I'm going to go ahead and click Add, New Item. And then we'll select HTML page, and we'll give it the name index. And then I'll add an H1 and say hello from the index page. And save that. OK, let's go ahead and start application. I'll do it without running debugging or doing debugging this time. Oh, and we got our error. Well, I didn't browse to index.html, so let me do that. Oh, that's interesting. We did the correct route this time, but we still got the exception. Hmm. So let's go back to our application and take a look at startup. Yeah. So there's our terminal middleware component. So our request is getting down there, but the static file is not being served. Well, this is an example of the build up approach again. Out of the box, static files are not going to be served from ASP.NET Core application. So first, we need to add that package to support doing that. So we can right click on our project, go to Manage NuGet Packages, and then we'll go to Browse. And the package that we're looking for contains the word or the string static files. And the very first one that showed up here on the list is the one that we're looking for. So I'm going to select that and then click Install. Click OK. Yes, I accept the terms. 
I had my lawyer look that over the other day, so we're good. Okay, the NuGet package is finished installing. And you can see over here that it is now in our NuGet dependencies list in Solution Explorer. And if we come back over to startup, we need to add the middleware component to handle static files. So we're going to say app.use static files. And I get an IntelliSense error. And this happened to me earlier when I was running through this. So what I'm going to do is, I'm not sure why this is happening, but I'm going to close the solution. And then I'm going to come back into it. And we'll see if we can make that error go away. And there we are. Control Shift B just to make sure that we're compiling, and we are. So let's, let's review that real quick. So our middleware pipeline now has three components. If we're in development, which we are, then we add the use developer exception page middleware component. Then we're adding use static files. And then our terminal, the middleware component at the end, the last one that runs, is throwing an exception. So I didn't mention that before, and maybe that wasn't absolutely clear. If you've played around at all with Node.js or previously in ASP.NET, you, uh, you could use Owen to set up middleware pipelines. The order that we add our components is the order that the request goes through in. So order is important here. We wouldn't, if we added static files after the app.run, it would never get there because app.run is always going to terminate the request and not go on through any further through the middleware pipeline. So we're going to want to make sure to put that before. OK, now let's control F5 and run our application one more time. And we still get the exception. Well, let's try browsing to our file again. Oh, great, success. This time we got hello from the index page. So that's great, but maybe we don't want to ask our users to have to specifically type in the URL to our, our static file or to our index page. Well, we can add another middleware component, use default files. And notice again, order matters. I'm having to do that before the static files component so that when the request comes in, if it's for the root of our site, it will modify the request, the path specifically, so that it includes a reference to our default file. So now, if we come over and take off the specific reference to the page, now we get our default index page without having to browse to it specifically. And notice that we're not getting to the end of the middleware pipeline anymore because use static files, well, let's take a step back, use default files, modify the request so it's looking for index.html, then Use static files, looked for that file in www.root, found that it was there, wrote that to that, that, read that file, wrote it to the response, and didn't call next invoke to go on to the next middleware component. So we short-circuited the request pipeline because there wasn't any other work that needed to be done. So that is a very quick overview of middleware components. There's a lot you can do with middleware components. You can write your own custom middleware components. When we do an MVC application in just a bit, you'll see that there is more to our middleware pipeline than what we're doing here right now. In fact, we'll see that MVC just ends up being another middleware component that we add to our pipeline. Now, what I want to do at this point is I want to show you a quick demo of using the .NET Core CLI to add a class library project to our solution. So why is this important? Well, if you're working in a mixed environment or uh, a team that, that's not just working on Windows only, let's say you have some, some developers, some front-end developers that are on Mac OS, they're going to want the ability to be able to create projects using a new project system, so CSProj, and add those projects potentially to the solution. And luckily, we have tools to do that. So I'm going to go into my projects folder, and I'm going to find my, pro there it is, first ASP.NET Core app. It's a classic application. And now I'm in the folder for our solution. So there's my .sln and my solution file that's loaded into Visual Studio. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the help for the command .NET new. So .NET is the .NET Core CLI. That's how we invoke it. And then we say new is the command for creating a new project. And we'll do dash dash help 
just to get some additional information about the command. We can see arguments that we can pass, options, and here specifically is what I wanted to show is the list of templates that are available to us. And here's the one that we're looking for. So class library, and it has a short name of class lib. So let's use that. So I'm going to say .NET new class lib so that we select that template, that project template. And then I'm going to use the n flag to name my project, shared project. Again, very creative my project names. Spent a lot of time working on that. And then I'm going to use the O flag to direct the output. So I'm going to create my project into a folder also called shared project. And then we can see that the template class library was created successfully. Here's our first project. So if we go into that folder in list, oop, wrong one, shared project. Thought that looked like too many files. Here we can see that there's a class1.cs and a shared project.csproj. So we've created our project, but we're not quite done yet. Now we need to add it to our solution. Well, luckily again, there's a .NET command to do exactly that. And that command, if we do .NET dash dash help, we'll see a list of our available commands. And that's the sln command, which allows us to modify solution files. So we can do .NET sln add shared library. And we want to include the paths of the folder. And then we want to say shared library csproj. We can do .NET sln list, which will show us the projects that are part of our solution now. So if we zoom in here, we can see that we have two projects. First, ASP.NET Core app. There's that CS project, which is the one we created in Visual Studio. And now we also have shared project CS project. If we jump back over to Visual Studio, we'll be prompted that, hey, our solution was modified outside of the environment. Imagine that. And we actually meant to do that. <laughs> so we're going to click Reload. And that will reload our solution. And lo and behold, here is our shared project, class library project that's now part of our solution. It's so great to be able to, to have the option to do these things outside of Visual Studio. Love having the choice, love having the flexibility. If we right click and select edit ASP, first ASP.NET Core app CS Prosh, then we can go in and see, oh, you know what? I missed a step here. What I wanted to do was go in and add a reference to our new class library project. So I added the project to the solution, which is great, but we're not consuming it from our ASP.NET Core project yet. So this works just like it did before. You right click, you add a reference to a, a, a project that's in your solution, you select it and say OK. But you notice as soon as I did that, now we have a project reference element in our CS project. And look at that, look how clean that is. It's just the path to the project file. No GUIDs to look at, really easy to do. In fact, we could have just edited this by hand if we knew that this was, in fact, the XML that it was going to generate. All right, moving on. Now it's time to go ahead and create our first MVC application. So I'm going to close this project. and We're going to go back to using the new project dialog. We can do that here from the start page. You can see that, that there's some templates here that we've recently used. Here's ASP.NET Core, webapplication.NET Core. Yep, that's the one we want to use. That takes us right to where we want to be. And this time, I'm going to name this first ASP.NET Core MVC app. And then click, and we're still targeting .NET Core, and we'll click OK. But this time, though, instead of empty, we'll choose the web application. We're still not going to use Docker. We could go in to our, to our authentication options, and now we have the ability to select individual user accounts or Windows authentication. Um, that's going to, that, if we selected one of those, it would use uh, identity, just like it did before if you were creating an ASP.NET project in Visual Studio 2015. But to keep things clean and simple, I'm going to go ahead and leave it as no auth. Open up Solution Explorer here. Great. So now 
you'll notice that there's some things that, that, that you would be, uh, if you're an MVC developer or have experience with this, you'll see some things that you expect to see. You see a controllers folder that's got a single controller in there. We have a views folder uh, with a home folder with some CS HTML files in there. All that should give you some good ASP.NET warm fuzzies, so to speak. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at startup and see how things look different here. Well, to start with, we have a constructor. So our startup class now has a constructor. And notice that iHosting environment is being injected. This is that application service that gives us information about our current environment. And it's being injected into our startup constructor. And what we're using this for is the, we're using the configuration builder to set up configuration for our application. Now, something that I didn't notice or I didn't point out before is notice that there's no longer a web config file as part of our project. That's because we don't use web config anymore for configuration. It's a much more flexible configuration system now. You can use JSON, you can use XML if you want to, any, or you can use a custom configuration, whatever format you want to use. We're going to use JSON, so let's go ahead and open up the app settings. And you can see here that it's just a straight, nothing fancy, JSON file. And we could add another value here. So we could say option one, and we could say some value. If we come back over to startup, let's talk about this a little bit. So it's using the builder pattern here, very similarly to how we configured our host over in program.cs. It's a Fluent API again. So right off the bat, we're saying set base path. This is saying use the base path, uh, our content root path as our base paths, which is the root of our project. And then we say add JSON file. And we're passing in the name of the file, which in this case is appsettings.json. It could be any name that you, that you want to use. And notice that we're also saying that this is not optional. There has to be one of these files in the root of our project. If we don't supply this file, we're going to get an exception when our application starts up. And then we're also saying to reload on change so that if we change that file, uh, the changes will be picked up. Then we add a second JSON file. So this is interesting. The name of this one is dynamic. It's being, so it's app settings dot, and then we're, we're using the, envir the current environment name in the, in the name of the file. So it would be app settings development dot JSON. And this one is optional. Then lastly, we're saying add environment variables. Now the order of these is important. So the first app settings.json file will get loaded, it's key value pairs. Then the second JSON file, if it's there, will get loaded. And if there's any keys that are repeated in there that have already been loaded, then it will overwrite the previous values. And then the last one that gets checked is we'll load key value pairs from environment variables. So because it's the last one, it wins. It, it trumps all of the others. Environment variables are great because that allows us, for instance, like if we're using an Azure app service to deploy and host our application, we can set those environment variables, uh, you know, sometimes which includes sensitive configuration data like API keys or database connection strings. We can set those as environment variables so we're not having to store them in a file. More secure that way. Then we say builder.build .build and we store that configuration into a property just so that we can make it available within configure services and the configure methods. Now, as we mentioned before, so that's configuration. There's a lot more to it than what we just covered there. Um, but given our time constraints, that's all that we can talk about for now. Uh, the ASP.NET Docs has a lot of great resources that walk you through how you can even use, for instance, strongly typed classes uh, to reference your configuration so you're not just dealing with string keys all the time. Pretty slick stuff. Now, we'll take a look at configure services and look, services.addMVC is an extension method that adds the services that we need for our MVC app. And those will be consumed uh, throughout other components within uh, MVC. So here's our configure. We're still referencing the same three application services as we did before. This time, not only we're we adding a console logger, but we're adding a debug logger. Again, logger provider pattern, so we can add as many providers, even custom ones that we write ourselves to this, and then we log throughout our application without really concerning ourselves with 
what logger or what provider they're going to be written out to. We set our level and we write a message and that you know, we can change this configuration in different environments uh, to be whatever we need to do. And for instance, here we're using console. Maybe we don't do that in staging or production. We do something else like write to a database or an API. Then we check to see if we're in development environment. If we are, we use our developer exception page again. We also configure browser link as a middleware component. If we're not in development, then we're using the use exception handler, handler middleware component. Now this handles exceptions, logs them, resets the request path, and then re-executes the request to this path. So this allows us to do like a pretty user-friendly error page. Then, like we did before, use static files because our uh, MVC application is going to have CSS and JavaScript. And then we say use MVC. And finally, here's where we add our MVC middleware. And notice that there's a callback that we're passing in, which allows us to set up our routes. In this case, we just have the single default route. You'll notice that the syntax here, if you've done MVC development before, is slightly different. Uh, we can set up our route parameters, and then in line, we can just set our default values, which is pretty cool, much more concise. Now, just wanted to point out, and I never see this get used very often, but we, we actually have the option or a, an extension method to call that says use, use MVC with default route. And so we could use that instead of the one that the template give us, gave us. If we didn't want to do that and stick with this, then we could add additional routes so we could say other routes here if we needed to, if our application needed those. So that is our middleware pipeline for our MVC application. Let's go ahead and run our app just so we can see uh, what, the pro what this project looks like that was created for us. And again, if you've done MVC development, you'll probably go, ah, oh, I've seen that before. Uh, warm, fuzzy feelings again. The familiar, yes. And continuing on that line, let's now take a look at a controller. So even though what we've seen, ASP.NET Core changes a lot of what's going on underneath, there's a lot that also will feel very familiar. So you know, a lot of that, that host configuration and the startup and configuring services and middleware pipeline, a lot of that tends to be front-loaded in the development process. And even though you might make changes here and there, that work is ten, tends to be done up front. And then the day-to-day -day activities, you know, you're working with controllers, you're working with views, you're working with you know, uh, your models and the database, that's the kind of stuff that you do maybe 80, 90% of the time. And luckily, ASP.NET Core follows a lot of the same ways of doing things that we had in the previous version. Here's our home controller. Notice that it inherits from a controller base class. Here's an action method. Now, instead of an action result concrete type, it is using an I action result interface, but the naming is similar, so that will feel very familiar. And then notice that we're returning a result, an action result, by calling view, which is defined in our base class. And then here's our about and contact action methods, and here's that error method that provides our uh, you know, friendly error, uh, user, uh, error message page to our users. So those are controllers. You know what, let's just add a new action method. So I'm gonna say public action result, and I'm just gonna call this one customers. I'm gonna imagine that we're, you know, have a list of customers on our website. And I'm gonna say return view. Now, I'm gonna right click on this and point out that um, this is something that I think will get fixed probably relatively soon. But, but what you would expect to see here is add view to invoke scaffolding to add that view. And it's not in the menu. And in fact, if we right click here on our controllers folder, now we do see this one, add controller. But when we do that, Visual Studio 2017 is gonna prompt us to add some dependencies uh, in order to, to get scaffolding. Like it, it's thinking that we need to finish building out our MVC application so that we can uh, use scaffolding for our MVC app. Well, we created this from the project template, so that's why I say that this feels um, a little sort of off kilter right now. I'm sure they'll get this fixed up. So I'm gonna go ahead and say use add full dependencies. And that's gonna take a, a, a few seconds here to go out and 
It's going through our project and adding the things that it thinks are missing. And once that's done, we'll be able to right click on that view method and be able to select, say, add view. We're given some, it's kind of cool. If, if you didn't have an MVC project set up and you wanted to do that, uh, it'll add all the dependencies and things that you need to your project and give you some instructions about how to modify your startup class. Pretty slick, actually. Now we can right click on view here and la la, we get add view. And that brings up the same dialog that, that, that again, you would expect to see. We can, it picks up the name from our action method for the view customers. We'll go ahead and use the layout page that we have. And once this finishes uh, scaffolding in our file, then we'll see our CS HTML Razor view. Here it is in all of its fantastic glory. All right, uh, now we need to do one more thing. Well, let's go ahead and, and run our application. Ah, so the one more thing, as you probably would guess, is that we don't have a menu item to get to our customers, but we can, oh, it's not, it's, Home is our controller, and customers is our action. And there it is. But we want to be able to give a, or have a menu item for our users. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to go into shared, and I'm going to pick layout. Notice that we have two layout pages. Again, this is part of that, that dialog that came up that said add dependencies. It erroneously adds this layout CSHTML without an underscore. We can just delete that. We don't need that. And I'm sure these things will get cleaned up in due time, so uh, these sort of anomalies will, will go away quickly. And here's our layout page. Now, that's kind of interesting. Notice here that we're getting some purple text. I haven't seen that before. Come down, scroll down. Oh, and here's our menu. And, huh, interesting. We're not seeing any HTML action link helper methods, but we are seeing some uh, unordered line items. You know, I'm just going to go ahead and hack this in here. So I'll, here's my anchor element. We have an ASP area. That sounds familiar. I recognize that. ASP controller, home, yep. ASP action contact. Well, I'm going to guess that this needs to be customers. And then the text for our anchor element should be customers. If we come out here then, oh, look at that. We get our menu item. And now I can click on contact and go to the contact page and click on customers and go to the customers page. That's exactly what we wanted. But what's going on here? So these new purple attributes or elements are what's known as tag helpers. Tag helpers are going to be, they're, they're really cool. Uh, so again, just for comparison's sake here, let's, let's create one of these menu items by using an HTML helper method. So we would typically use action link. And then uh, I always forget what the first parameter is. Uh, right, it's the link text. So I'm going to say, and I'll just call this test. And then we'll say index. And then uh, continuing on, oh right, route values. And, and I'm trying to get to the point where we can do uh, CSS classes. Because I want to be able to style. Ah, there it is. It's the fourth parameter. And we have to do one, you know, we've all done this a million times. But we have to do one of these anonymous objects and then prefix it with an at because it's a reserved keyword, at class, and now I could, let's say we're using bootstrap and I could say button, mm, but I don't remember, let's see, it's button, button, dash, danger, I believe, right? Really user friendly. In fact, if you pass this off to your designer and your team, I'm sure they're gonna love you to go through and add a bunch of classes that way. Now with tag helpers, we're able to, to apply server-side code or decorate our, our elements with attributes or even have custom elements that invoke server-side code to be able to render markup in our views. So this ASP action is specifically, and is in concert with ASP controller, is being used to create the href attribute on the anchor element. But check this out, because these are just, they appear as attributes in markup, we can now just say class like, like we would expect to. And furthermore, because we're just in markup, we get IntelliSense that shows us the CSS classes that are available. And so 
uh, earlier when I was struggling to try to remember that it was button space button dash danger. I get the confirmation that that's what I want and it's just, you know, it's less cognitive work uh, to have to do that. Those are tag helpers. Huge improvement over, I think, over what uh, HTML helpers and, you know, if you're like me, I'm substantially like on larger or non-trivial projects, I tended to find that I had sort of a library of uh, H custom HTML helpers that I would use in order to make it easier to create forms. Well, you can create your own custom tag helpers as well. In fact, let's take a quick look at what a form looks like using tag helpers because, again, uh, I think you'll appreciate uh, that how beneficial it looks. So first we're going to take a look at the form using uh, HTML helper methods. And so we have begin form, and then we have label four, text box four, and we're using the, the, the four versions here, so we're able to pass in a, a lambda or a link expression to identify the property. That's pretty cool, we get IntelliSense, right? So I can say dot name, and I know that, that you know, it's not just a magic string, I, I, it's much, much harder to make a mistake there, but we're still having to do this, this anonymous object and at class it really adds a, a, a lot of verboseness to our code. Now let's look at the tag helper version. What do you think? A lot cleaner, right? So if we switch between the two, there's the HTML helper version. Here's the tag helper version. And again, because we're just inside of a regular uh, HTML, or, uh, HTML element attribute, we're able to get IntelliSense support. Now, you might be looking at this ASP4 and, and thinking, well, James, yeah, but now you're typing a name magic string in here. Actually, it's not. The ASP.NET Core and Visual Studio is smart enough to know, the editor is smart enough to know that we're inside of a tag helper here, and the value for this is C sharp code. So we get IntelliSense for the model. This is a strongly typed view. We're using at model up here and setting it to our models.contact model. So we're being shown the members on that model. And so here I can select name and know that it's correct. And if I were to pick something that doesn't exist on the model, we should get, we should get an error. Yep, and right there it says contact does not contain a definition for ASDF. Well, of course it doesn't. And we'll change this back to name. Now, something I want to point out real quick is that when you use Visual Studio 2017, you install it for the first time and create an ASP.NET Core project, you're not going to get this nice purple highlighting and the editor won't recognize tag helpers. They'll absolutely work runtime, but your design time experience is going to be a little bit lacking. And you want to be able to see these cool pop-up helpers and information as well about what the tag helper is doing. To get that, you need to install an extension. So if you go to extensions and updates, and I'll search for my install, and I'll type in Razor here. So Razor Language Services. Go search for that extension and install it, and you'll get this nice editor support for tag helpers. The last thing that I want to look at here real quick is API controllers. In ASP.NET Core, there isn't a separate base class for API controllers anymore. Web API has been merged with MVC. So you'll notice that our contacts controller, which this is an API controller, is inheriting from the same controller base class that our MVC controller did. This is great. If you ever had to create a custom filter, for instance, like if you were doing some sort of custom authentication authorization, you had to, in previous versions of ASP.NET, you had to implement that twice once for MVC and once for Web API. You won't have to do that anymore because it's a single base controller. You'll notice here that we have a route attribute and we're able to use this controller token so that we don't have to repeat the name of our controller. That's really great if we rename our class, then the name will just flow up into that route attribute. One other big change is that even though I've named my method git, I have to be explicit about the fact that this is, should be associated with git requests. It's no longer going to pick up the naming of my action methods. And then here's an example of using 
our route parameters directly in our action or in, in our uh, HTTP get attribute. So we don't have to have separate attributes. We can just specify what our, that we expect an ID parameter, much more concise and elegant than it was before. And here is our put method, and here is our delete method. It's just a quick overview. The rest of this code should look very familiar. We still have our same helper method here for returning no content, for instance, or not found, so forth and so forth, or created at action, whatnot. So all of that should feel very familiar, and there's more to know about Web API, of course, in ASP.NET Core, but that's what we have time for today. So real quickly, let's do some wrap up here. And get to the right place in the slides. Sorry about that. Excellent, here's our wrap up. So what didn't we cover? We didn't cover deployment. We didn't cover Docker. We didn't cover Entity Framework Core, which is a new lightweight cross-platform version of Entity Framework. We didn't cover web front, front end web development. Identity, view components, there's a lot more to this. But there are great resources. All of the resources and demo code that I showed you today, plus some extra stuff that we didn't even get to, is available at this GitHub repo. And if you, need to dig, if you want to dig further into this, be sure to check out these Microsoft Virtual Academy courses on ASP.NET Core. There's an introductory course, there's an intermediate course, and there's a more advanced cross-platform course. These are taught by Scott Hanselman and Maria Nagaga. Really great content that's freely available. Go check it out. Also, as I mentioned in the beginning, I work for Treehouse. We have a seven-day free trial that gives you our full access to our library. A lot of great C-sharp.net content up there including a workshop that I did on ASP.NET Core. So go to teamtreehouse.com and start your learning there today. Thank you very much for tuning in. And that's all that I've got. See you later.